It was 8.07 a.m. on a Saturday morning. We were getting ready to go to the farmer's market. I was in the living room sipping coffee. Our nephew rushed in with his cell phone, showing it to us, this message. That's a startling thing to see on your phone. I ran to see if it was on my phone, and it was on my phone too. Our phone started going off with this alarm system. I was one of over a million people who all got the message on our cell phones. Ballistic missile threat, inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a test. Inbound ballistic missile. This is not a drill. Fell in love with a crooked world and everything that comes with it. Myself with none of it. I love when you take it, won't you? This is no joke. Like, there's a f missile coming to Hawaii right now. I don't know what to do. We gotta see Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. At first, it was this feeling of, can this be real? Everyone was calling 911 at the same time so we couldn't get through. If you are indoors, stay indoors. If you are outdoors, seek immediate shelter in a building. I immediately thought of my dear friend, Felicia Cowden. So I started to dial her. That morning, I was with three friends and we were in a car. And just as we pulled up right in front of my house, all four of our phones started going off with this ballistic missile alert. After what seemed like an eternity, she called me back. And she said, Cynthia, the county's telling us to take shelter. We could be hit in minutes. This is not a drill. I don't know what to do. Measures. I have been trained when I was an engineer as an emergency shelter survey worker. I knew there was nothing that would actually protect us. So if it was really coming, we'd do best to be hit by the blast. And so the first thing was, where do we go? We decided to shelter in a meditation cave on a neighbor's property. And then it was, what do I take with me? I grabbed a bag and I started throwing things in it. People are standing around looking up at the sky and trying to figure out what to do right now. People responded in different ways. You saw the, the images of families crawling into a sewer, people panicking and crying. And some people I heard said, oh, I'm just gonna go out and surf. My response, like maybe a lot of people's, was just total disbelief. Like, what? Is this a joke? Is this real? Do I get food? Do I call my family and say goodbye? I, I don't have time to call people. Let's go in the center of the house, which is a small bathroom in the middle of the house, and it's the most protected part of the house. We're kind of just huddled in there. And then I was like, if something bad happens, we need water. And my son, who was like 13 at the time, I think he thought, why, why is he putting water in the tub? And my wife understood, but I think it's a human instinct. You know, impending doom, I want to be with the people who I care about. I started driving. It was only at that moment that I allowed myself to think of my eldest daughter who had just left for Los Angeles. And I thought, I need to call her. And I said, Mackenzie, I don't know if you've heard, but we've all gotten a message on our cell phones that we're gonna be hit by a nuclear missile. We're going to shelter in the cave, but I just want you to know that I love you. And she said, Mom, I love you too. It was the moment that really changed everything for me. I stood there frozen. And then I thought, wait a second. What if this is the beginning of one of those accidental nuclear wars? What if this is the beginning of the end of life as we know it? My background since 1978, my first trip to the Soviet Union has been in US-Soviet and US-Russia relations, and then Russian studies, and then citizen diplomacy work people-to-people -people work, and that's the work that really I did in the 1980s during the Cold War. 
It took our government 38 minutes to get the word out on our cell phones that it was a false alarm. And even with everything I knew about nuclear weapons, nuclear war was unimaginable to me until I lived through those 38 minutes. Now it lives inside of me, and it's never going to go away until we eliminate nuclear weapons. As it may seem, so I'm searching for the light as I drown in my They called off the alert, and then we have a very forgiving community here. I wasn't angry. Someone made a mistake, as people do. I accept responsibility for this. This is my team. We made a mistake. I write about security issues. I write about uh, the impact of the United States and foreign policy, and how it affects particularly people and the environment in uh, Asia and the Pacific region. So there was, you know, political tension with the U.S. and North Korea. This is during the Trump administration and, and all the threats and taunts and jabs by the exchange between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. The North Koreans have tested more weapons in the past couple of months of 2017 than in the years previously. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. So we have somebody who's you know, not quite up to the task of handling these dangerous weapons and, and unhinged enough that they might actually use it. There's a lot of people up there. And then on top of that, in Hawaii, because of what had happened earlier when uh, North Korea had fired some missiles in the direction of Guam, I knew they were going to do the first test of this new missile warning. So that had all happened in 2017. Early January of 2018, we get this text message. There were no sirens. I'm the founder of Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy and NuclearWakeUpCall.Earth. I am also a documentary filmmaker. I work for the abolition of nuclear weapons. I grew up during the Cold War. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis crisis on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact the purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. I grew up hearing that the Soviet Union was always going to be our enemy and that we were all most likely going to die in a nuclear war. The awesome mushroom cloud is observed closely by both military and civilian personnel. Something about that enemy story didn't sit well with me. I told my parents when I was very young that I was going to be going to Russia someday. I started studying Russian uh, on my own during the Cold War. And there were some projects that I was involved in that specifically related to nuclear weapons, like interviewing Soviet kids about their fears of nuclear war, things like that. But it, I really felt that it was important to work on changing the relationship through the power of people-to-people -people diplomacy. There was a handful of us during this work. And then to witness people rising up all over the world, and especially between the United States and Russia, connecting. We saw this triumph of people over politics. When the Cold War came to an end, for a period, Russia was not our enemy. But the trauma was never healed in the larger relationship. I never imagined that would be where we are today with U.S.-Russia relations and the horrific, brutal invasion of Ukraine. There are so many reasons why the risk is greater today than it was during the Cold War. We have hypersonic missiles that fly 20 times the speed of sound, and we have dual-capable missiles that can carry conventional or nuclear weapons. We have really a multipolar nuclear world. After the end of the Cold War, the public rightly thought that it was over, but the politicians should have known better and stayed in that arms control and, and, and solidified, and they didn't. The Bulletin is an organization that focuses on 
man-made threats to human existence. We come out of the nuclear era. Part of the Manhattan Project started here, and we were founded by scientists who understood the dangers associated with their creation. The bulletin sets the doomsday clock. It was created by an artist who was married to a Manhattan Project scientist back in 1947. It was the first cover of the first magazine that the bulletin published. In 1949, when the Soviets tested their first atomic weapon, the editor of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock closer to midnight. So suddenly, this passive art piece became active. As science has evolved, so has the doomsday clock. And it now really answers two fundamental questions. Is humanity safer or a greater risk this year compared to last year when we set it? And is humanity safer or a greater risk this year compared to the 75 plus years now that we've been setting it? It's a very blunt instrument, but it's a way to very concisely and immediately convey how are we doing? And we're not doing very well. The bulletin declared climate as an existential threat decades ago. No longer could we talk about is humanity safer or greater risk without including climate. The founders of our organization understood that science was moving very quickly, bringing huge opportunities, but also real risk. We're not investing in the global guardrails that would make us feel safe. Every effort should be made to end nuclear tests. These were our words in 2010, when the General Assembly declared the International Day Against Nuclear Tests on 29th of August. Yet today, in this assembly, there is little reason to celebrate. Global military spending reached a record $2.2 trillion in 2022. Are we now safer? Not at all. We are closer than any other time in the century to global catastrophe. There was a time where it was thought that we could end up with 25, maybe 30 states in the world that could have nuclear weapons. So let's be clear, we have nine. That's way less than 25 or 30. When we look at the numbers of weapons, that are in existence around the world, the number is way, way down on what it was immediately post-Cold War. But as many would say, for as long as nuclear weapons exist, there is the risk that they could be used. And the time for launching is at hand. 90% of the world's nuclear weapons are controlled by the United States and Russia. There's only one bilateral nuclear agreement left between the U.S. and the Russians, and that even is about to expire. Since 2010, what you've seen in the nuclear space is an absolute dismantling of the nuclear arms control architecture. And I believe that is why at the very global level, our failure to respond to keep humanity safe is siphoning down to the individual on the street that feels like, whoa, you know, someone's not watching the shop here. The situation we face at the moment is probably a surprise to many that we would be in a situation where there are even threats of the use of nuclear weapons. We also have the possibility of a further nuclear test, concerns about nuclear material in various places. So the, there are dark clouds, there are no doubt. И при угрозе территориальной целостности нашей страны, для защиты России и нашего народа, мы безусловно используем все имеющиеся в нашем распоряжении средства. Это не блеф.
小さなね一つの船に見えます宇宙船地球号地球という名前ですよねでそのねその船に乗ってるんですみんな世界中がねで誰も助からない今まだ火星にも行けない月にも行けませんだから私たちはみんなその船のクルーですクルーメンバーですあのすぐに核兵器使われば1回で終わりになりますからねこれが全員死にました私の,あの同級生ですで私がここにいますだからこれ亡くなった人たちは何も物が言えないんですねでそれ、まあ、私が代わりに言うことが今は彼らを慰めになるんじゃないかと思ってます1945年8月あの6日広島の牛田というあの爆心地から 2.3 キロ離れた場所で,でその朝あの転校した学校へ行く途中でした友達を待っていたんですねで桜の木の下におりましたそうすると友達が「敵だ B29 だ!」と言ったので桜の陰から出て空を見上げましたそうするとその途端にピカッとそのものすごい光線が襲ってきましたそしてもう、ま、辺りは真っ白になってあの何も見えなくなりましたでそ,その次にあのあれですね爆風で私は吹き飛ばされたんですね水ぶくれがいっぱいできてやけどがですねそれでもうすごい激痛が襲ってきましたで人々はみんな手をこうして上にあの上げてねこうあの逃げてきましたたくさんの人がですねあの本当に幽霊かゾンビの,あ,のあれですね形ですよねそれでどうしてこう,こうしてあの人がやってるか皆さん分かりますかね私にはよく分かるんですなぜならあのあれですねもう本当に肩からあのあれですね皮膚がむけ落ちるんですねやけどすると爪のところで止まってみんなここであの皮膚をぶら下げてるわけです私は今でもあのト,メト,トマトのねあのバーベキューの取ってきてトメト焼きますねそうすると皮がつるっとむけますそれを見るとあのトラウマで。あのトローマが出てそれでゾッと今でもします人間で同じことが起こった原爆の時に怪我もそのやけどもない人ですねその人が本当に健康そうな人が死んでいきましただからみんな不思議に思いましたそれは放射能のことを知らなかったその人たちの数は14万人の広島のこう死んだ人の数に入ってないです<笑>あの This year, I will get very good plum. <笑> Sunlight is very important. これはすごい酸っぱくて辛いです。85歳でやっとあの梅干しがうまくつけられるようになりました。<笑>原爆の時に破壊された町の,あの家の破れた天井から青い空を見ました。でその青空を見た時にああ昨日と同じ空があるまた明日もあるかもしれないフォーチュネイトリー I was able to marry and had a happy family life My husband did not seem to mind That I was a Hibakusha. But when our first child was born, he was scared. He seriously checked the baby's fingers and toes. Then I realized that he had been worried about the damage of the bomb on our baby. Ah, I know, two kids are in the house, and I know, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. 子どもたちは原爆の私の被害を知りませんでしたねでも最近はこの十何年間かあのもうそのはっきり分かったので息子のお嫁さんあの息子は東京に住んで仕事しておりますお嫁さんが長崎の被爆者の
孤児の娘ですそれはあのそのことを知らずに2人は恋愛をしました結婚しましただけどどこかでその自分のトラウマは慰めなければならなかったそうするとアートで自分のメッセージを入れる本当にあのポイントで入れてますみんなに見せるアートじゃなかった私は自分のためにアートを作ったそしてそれを作ってみんなどの作品にも原爆のイメージが入ってますそしてあの今はここにねあの皆さんがあの世界から来てそしてあのいろんな若い人がねあのここで話を聞いてだから今あ,のあっちこっち行ってますよ。国にすると83カ国かな。My generation will be the last to tell you about this event.Nobody on this planet should suffer this same tragedy. Today, the members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the Doomsday Clock forward, the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. This year, we set the Doomsday Clock at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest it has ever been. And we mean it. We think we're in a particularly dangerous time. If you kind of go through the exercise of what are the things that Would have these dire consequences, but what's the likeliest one? Then you end up with things like, you know, climate change, which is clearly happening. Same with nuclear. If there were a full nuclear exchange, we're talking about thousands of weapons, all of which are now ready to go. It could be happening right now as we're doing this interview. The missiles could be flying, and we'll never get to the end. We got letters from people who say, it feels like something is wrong. It feels like something is broken. Thank you like for cutting through the noise that's out there and saying it, that we need to pay attention to these issues of climate change, of advancing science and technology, of the current nuclear situation, of bio risks and artificial intelligence, all these things. You end up mostly worrying about these kind of more pedestrian things. Pandemics, nuclear war, AI, climate, the things we're doing to ourselves. I think that's, that's the good sign. I mean, we know what we're doing. We could fix that, stop it, change things. There's, there's hope. As I walked away from the cave, my first feeling was gratitude. It was this feeling of, my God, I'm still here. We're all still here. I looked around and everything looked new. I just stood there and watched the palm trees dancing in the wind. It was like all my senses were enhanced. And then I thought, you need to share this. Because it was an apocalypse that didn't happen. It was this feeling of a, a near miss that gave people the chance to imagine it. So one of the things that I do is a simulation where I take people to face the impossible choices, questions, decisions we had to make. And I ask people to really think about if they could just call one person, who would that one person be and what would they want to say? And that has a way of actually making the nuclear issue personal, taking it out of this abstract thinking in our heads that it's too big, that there's nothing I can do. If nuclear weapons can destroy all of us and all we love, we all have a stake and a role to play in eliminating them. <laughs>